Hello, my name is Scott Mandia. I'm a professor of physical sciences at Suffolk County Community College. I've been teaching meteorology and climate change courses for 35 years, three years at Penn State University, and the last 32 years at Suffolk County Community College. Today we're going to talk about climate change and the national security implications of the impacts of climate change. So first we have to start off showing that the planet is actually warming. Basically, anywhere where you can put a thermometer in the ocean, atmosphere, surface, you're seeing warming trends, and you're seeing those warming trends accelerating. So this picture here is the amount of ice at the North Pole, Arctic sea ice, which you can see has definitely been in a downward trend in the last decade or so. We've seen some record low amounts of sea ice, which you would expect on a warming planet. We can take a look at the land and ocean temperatures over time, and you can see since 1900 we've been going upward. When you actually look at the 10 hottest global years on record, you can see that they all have been in the 2000s, and the last few years have been some of the hottest. And it turns out this year, 2023, uh, because of an El Nino would help enhance the uh, reason why we're warming, we might actually see the hottest year in 2023 or 2024. The other thing we can notice here is ocean heat content, right? The ocean covers 70% of the surface of the earth and has a tremendous amount of mass so that's going to absorb some extra heat which we're going to see soon you can see that global heat content in the top part of the ocean has also been accelerating so basically i could probably show you a hundred of these different types of slides that prove the planet is actually warming so what we're going to end up doing now is we're going to approach this like you might approach a courtroom drama right something on dateline or 48 hours so you don't have a dead body, you have a warming planet. And so you're looking for the, the criminal, the person who killed, you know, had the dead body is the result of. And uh, so in this case, it's going to be, all right, the planet is warming, who caused it? And so when we actually look at all of the things that cause climate change from timescales that last millions of years to timescales that last just a few years, we can see that all of the natural causes of climate change have an alibi. And in fact, if you take what I teach in my class, if you take a close look at the natural causes of climate change, you will see actually they're trying to drive the planet toward cooling. So believe it or not, if humans were not on the planet right now, we would be headed toward the next major ice uh, age and like max glaciation. So basically, um, we know the physics tells us that humans are causing climate change and the pattern of warming matches the human emitted heat trapping gases okay so basically the amount of sun coming in hasn't really changed but the amount of heat that's trying to escape has been decreased so it's almost like if you think of this as a bank account and energy is dollars your deposits are been the same for 100 years but your withdrawals are starting to increase which means you're gaining in your checking or savings account which would be really nice um, but in this case we're gaining energy and that's warming the planet so the human fingerprint is all over the body, so to speak. So we've known this for a long time, um, but more recently, uh, major scientific organizations have put out official climate change statements. And you can see way back in 2010, the United States National Academy of Sciences, which was created by Abraham Lincoln, because Abraham Lincoln decided that we're going to have some scientific and technical types of questions that the government's going to have to react to. The politicians aren't experts in science and economics and engineering. So he created the National Academy of Sciences sort of as our all-star team of the, the, as we would say in Will Smith's Men in Black, best of the best of the best in all the different areas of science and technology. And then that National Academy has basically said that we know the planet's warming and we know it's caused by human activities and it will pose significant risks for humans and nature. We also see in 2014, uh, the British Royal Society, which is like our National Academy of Sciences, basically said we're more certain than ever that humans are changing the climate. So this really isn't something new. So there have been a variety of different um, papers out there trying to gauge the percentage of experts who agree with what I'm teaching you right here. And typically the number is anywhere between 90 and 100%, but generally 97% is considered to be the number. So if you were to go to a conference and you were to ask 100 of the scientists there, is the planet warming? They'd say yes. And then 
who's responsible, 97 out of 100 of them would say it's humans. Although I would argue that, and I've published a paper on this, that the other 3% generally are consistently wrong and their papers never really get, uh, they get past peer review occasionally, but they don't stand the test of time. But so it's really 100% of scientists who publish and don't basically screw up the, the data. And then if you actually look at all the different international academies of science around the world, all of them, and they represent tens of thousands of experts, so they don't make these position statements lightly, all of them agree that humans are causing global warming and it's a risk. So it's kind of like if you were on an airplane and you looked out the window and you saw a hundred mechanics milling about the plane and the captain gets on and she says, just so you know, those are mechanics out there. Uh, 97 of them say this plane is never going to make it to our destination. It's going to crash. Two of them say they're not really sure. And one says, don't worry about it, folks. Have a nice flight. I don't think most of us would stay on that aircraft, right? So you basically have to go with an overwhelming majority of scientists. And you have to understand, scientists don't like to agree with each other. You sort of get famous, right? Think of Darwin and Galileo, right? You get famous for proving other scientists wrong. So the fact that everybody's pretty much on board means this is clearly what's going on. So we might say, okay, well, we know humans are causing climate change. Well, how are humans causing climate change? And it turns out that there's a gas that's invisible, it's called carbon dioxide, that is natural in the atmosphere, but is reaching incredibly high unnatural concentrations. And it turns out that humans are causing that increase. So when we use fossil fuels, which are coal, natural gas, or methane, and oil, which we take out of the ground, those took millions and millions of years to, for nature to put in the ground. It's basically just dead plants and animals that have been pressurized over millions of years. We're taking them out in a few decades and rapidly putting them back in the air. So we're pretty much putting the carbon dioxide back in the air at a hundred times the rate of which nature could possibly take it out. So uh, and we do that because coal and natural gas provide electricity, and of course oil you can refine into jet fuel, gasoline, diesel fuel, home heating. So it turns out that we need these energy sources to sort of power our planet, but we didn't realize when we started using them in massive amounts that it was going to release this much CO2 and then cause climate to change. Okay, so here's a little diagram uh, that shows that when you burn anything that has a hydrocarbon in it, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, one of the byproducts is going to be carbon dioxide. So when you're following behind a car, for example, now again, I know they have emission controls, but let's just pretend we don't have a catalytic converter. The stuff that's coming out that pipe would be CO2 and water. Okay, So every power plant that we have that uses coal and natural gas or every mode of transportation that uses some type of fuel other than electric cars, for example, are all emitting carbon dioxide, and it's really adding up. So if we take a look at the amount of carbon dioxide that's been in our atmosphere for the last 800,000 years, this little picture on the, on the left, we can see that it naturally went up and down between about 180 and 280 parts per million, and it roughly took tens of thousands of years to do that. We are now at 425 parts per million, and you can see we just launched straight upward. So basically, since we started burning coal, oil, and gas, primarily around 1850, but more so after World War II, we are now at levels of carbon dioxide that haven't been seen for 800,000 years. And you might wonder, how do we know what carbon dioxide was? We weren't around 800,000 years ago measuring this stuff like we are today. And it turns out that when it snows, snow traps the air at the time. And then as more and more snow piles up on top, Right? Something called sintering happens where it gets compressed into a block of ice. And so this ice core on the left-hand side comes from Antarctica, which has been around for millions of years. So imagine you have a pile of snow at the end of your driveway because you've been shoveling snow all season. At the very bottom of that, it literally is solid ice. Well, inside that solid ice, there are bubbles of air. And if you've ever seen Jurassic Park, it's the same concept where if there's a mosquito inside that amber, and you can get the blood out of that mosquito, you can get dinosaur DNA. It's a similar type of thing. So we put this big, huge drill down to the bedrock in Antarctica. You take out that ice, and you can date it by looking at uh, lines in the ice. Then you melt the ice in a special chamber, and you count the number of carbon dioxide molecules. And what you'll see is 
numbers have the units of ppm that means parts per million so what that means is if i were to have a magic lasso or a magic bag or something and i could capture a million air molecules right now 425 of those would be carbon dioxide you know most of them are oxygen and then i mean nitrogen and then oxygen but what we see is over the last 800,000 years that was never the case we basically pretty much never got over 300 now we're way above here Right? And so if you take a look at how CO2 has changed over the last 2,000 years or so, you see it's what we call this is a hockey stick, right? It looks like the handle and the stick. So when you actually look at a lot of data in climate change, you get these hockey sticks because in very recent times, things have just launched upward. So it turns out that the last time we had CO2 levels this high was between 2 and 3 million years ago. Okay, so this is clearly something that humanity has never experienced in our existence as a, as a species, not modern humanity anyway. All right, so we know as a globe we're emitting this much, but, you know, are we all doing it equally as a country? And it turns out, no, not at all. So if you take a look at this diagram, you can see that China is emitting about 13% of all of the CO2 that's coming into the atmosphere in the last decade or so. The United States is second. Right, so it's one out of five extra CO2 molecules on the planet is coming from China and the US. Right, and then we can see Europe, Russia, so basically all the sort of big industrialized countries, and it would make sense because they're going to be burning more energy if they're industrialized, they're basically responsible for a majority of the CO2 that's going into the atmosphere. And then you see Central South America, Africa, and the Middle East, right? They don't really put out that much. They're not nearly as industrialized. Okay, so if you're going to ask somebody to reduce carbon emissions, it kind of makes sense that you would go for the big pieces of the pie here because that's where you can get it done. Okay. Now, I also argue when I teach this with my students, yes, China is number one right now for emissions, but the United States is responsible for most of the extra CO2 that's in the atmosphere right now because China has only been recently industrialized. The other thing I mentioned is that you got to remember China has uh, over a billion people, right? So with a country with four times as many people as the United States, you would expect they're going to have more emissions. Finally, China is the major manufacturing uh, country in the world. And so if you're here in the United States and you're buying something that says made in China, that CO2 came into the atmosphere to get you something into your hands. Um, so I don't think it's fair all the time to say, well, China's the biggest problem. I think the United States is historically the biggest problem. China's the biggest problem right now as far as how much they put out. But these two countries really have to take the lead because they're by far the biggest piece of the, of the pie. And it turns out that Europe has been doing a much better job at trying to control their emissions than China, the United States, and Russia. Okay? So I think a fair analysis would be What's the carbon footprint for an individual in these countries? And you'll see that at, we're only after Australia. United States, we're basically carbon pigs. We have a very large carbon footprint. We live in big houses. We drive uh, cars that have bad gas mileage. Uh, we like to leave our lights on, right, that kind of thing. We buy a lot of stuff that, has, you know, that needed to be manufactured. And if you see China down here, it's only 5.5. So you can see that China is almost one-third of what we do per person. Right. And the only reason why China's got a much bigger number is because they have so many more people. Right. So it does look like Australia, U.S., Canada, Russia and Germany kind of have to take the lead to try to get people to maybe think about, is there a way I can live the way I want to live, but maybe not have as many CO2 emissions? And there are ways to do that, which we will talk about. All right. So now we want to take a look at this is a national security talk. We want to take a look at which countries are the most in danger of a warming planet. A little sip of coffee there. And what you see is the countries that are responsible for most of the global warming, US, Canada, Russia, China, Europe, they're the least affected by climate change. The countries like Central South America, Africa, and the Middle East, those are the ones that cause the least amount of carbon pollution and are the most at risk from climate change. So we sort of have this justice issue here that it's almost like your neighbor has been polluting the entire neighborhood. 
you did nothing wrong, and now you have a polluted neighborhood too. You have a polluted backyard too, but it really wasn't your fault. And maybe you're even more at risk because you have animals and the neighbor doesn't, right? You have pets and stuff. So the bottom line is basically the ones who cause most of the problem, that the risks are being put on the people who really didn't cause the problem. Okay, and we're going to get back to that because if you think about some of these places, think about how politically unstable they are and whether or not they like, you know, Western or American politics, which we're going to get into. All right, so sometimes people think, oh, this, you know, climate change stuff is new the last 15, 20 years. It's actually not. So Joseph Fourier is known as, a, he's a famous mathematician. If you take calculus, you're going to do Fourier series and things like that. He actually proved mathematically that if we were to increase CO2 in the atmosphere, the planet should warm. Then John Tyndall in 1859, so this is almost 200 years ago, he proved in a lab that if you add CO2 to a tube and you shine an infrared heat light through it, that it wouldn't reach the other side if you put enough CO2 in there. So he showed that CO2 actually would trap heat. And then in the 1960s, the United States Air Force did a big experiment above the skies of Massachusetts because they were seeing that their heat-seeking missiles were missing the the engine heat from the enemy aircraft that they're trying to shoot down. So they did a bunch of studies and they showed, oh, it's the CO2 that's between the missile head and the target that's getting in the way so it's not able to see the heat. So they figured out how climate change, or excuse me, how carbon dioxide trapped heat and they tuned their missiles to see through certain wavelengths of CO2 that actually don't trap infrared heat. So it's very narrow, but there's a few little what we call atmospheric windows there. And so now the missiles can shoot planes out of the sky. So we had mathematicians, old time scientists, and of course the United States Air Force, all showing that CO2 in the atmosphere absolutely traps heat. Okay. So I think it's unfortunate, but a lot of times people approach climate change as an environmental issue. And uh, one of the most annoying images I see now is that polar bear floating on a small piece of ice. It's very sad. Absolutely polar bears are really, really in trouble because they hunt on the ice. The ice is disappearing. We showed that picture earlier. However, that's so far away at the North Pole, the average person doesn't really think about polar bears <laughs> every single day, right? What you do think about is your kids. And so these are my boys. My wife took this picture when my boys were really, really young. They're, they're high school and college now. And as I was watching them play in the water, I thought, wow, these kids think the ocean is awesome and how fun this is. But because we live along the coastline, I know about sea level rise and climate change and hurricanes. I'm thinking, this is one of our biggest enemies, believe it or not. And I thought, as a father, I said, I can't let my children grow up in such a dangerous world and not try to make it better. So the reason why I'm doing all this is really because I wanted to let my kids know that I thought this was important for their future. And dad's going to try to do something to make their future as bright as mine was. And Every parent wants to have a better future for the children they had. And unfortunately, this is the first generation where that's actually maybe not going to be able to happen. So uh, we, it can, but, you know, we'll have to see. We'll talk a little bit about that, too. All right. So speaking of humans, if you take a look at this diagram, it goes back 20,000 years. And you'll see that in the last 20,000 years, temperatures have very slowly been rising, rising. Then they kind of held constant for a few thousand years, and they literally were dipping down before 1850. So these were those natural climate cycles I talked about where all of those things are trying to drive us toward the next ice age, and then boom, suddenly humans realize we can burn coal, oil, and gas. We start spiking up here. All right. I don't know if on this software I'm using you can see this arrow or not, that I, my mouse cursor. But anyway, so this brown area right here, okay, these are temperatures unknown to modern humans. And so this light green here is basically, you know, the, the species of, you know, humanity where we actually were able to do agriculture. I mean, we weren't hunters and gatherers with, you know, skins over us and spears looking for food and constantly on the move. This is when we actually could build a home and start farming. So stay put. We are now at temperatures outside of all of human history where we weren't hunters and gatherers. Right. So this is this is unknown territory for everybody who's watching this presentation right now. 
In fact, I say to my students, if you're under 40 years old, you've never ever lived on this planet where the monthly average temperature for the planet hasn't been above normal. So basically, every single month that you've been living, if you take the average temperature of the planet, it's above normal. So the normal just keeps going up. Okay? So we don't really want to go up to some of these crazy numbers here. So you'll see right here it says 2 degrees C is sort of safe warming. Um, not really. I think 1.5 is probably better. We're at 1.2 now. But basically we know that we can't warm the planet much more before we start getting into trouble. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So being on Long Island, we see Sandy here. Sandy, even though technically when it hit us wasn't a hurricane, devastating. Uh, millions and millions of dollars of damage. And it turns out that um, if we were to have a Category 4 hurricane hit right around the New York City Harbor area, there could be as much as a trillion dollars in insured property loss. That after Florida, New York State, believe it or not, has the second most coastal insured property in the country. You wouldn't expect that, but then if you think about all of the property around Long Island and around the city, there's some serious wealth there that has to be insured. Okay, so we know that we're getting higher sea levels. We know we're going to get more powerful storms because of the hot oceans. So the likelihood of us having one of these uh, Katrina type of payouts is increasing as we keep warming the planet. Okay? So if we look away from the United States and we look around the world, You'll see anywhere where you see a large red dot, these are all areas that are extremely dangerous from rising sea levels. And you can see that along the Nile. We can see that the Ganges, Brahmaputra, Vietnam area. So basically, even Mississippi is considered high. We saw that with uh, Katrina, the devastation that was caused there. So there are a lot of people who live along the ocean. And the reason why is because along the ocean, you can have fishing. You have ports, so you can have trade, and the soil tends to be good for agriculture, which I'm going to show you something with Egypt down the road. So if you think about it, these are ancient locations, and when people were building their ports there, when they were building their cities and they're uh, plowing the fields, they assumed the ocean wasn't going to change where it was. So now it's rapidly rising and which means it's coming farther inland and if storms are stronger then it just does even more damage so there's millions and millions of people who are probably not going to be able to live where they currently live and if you think about millions of people on the move that's never a good thing right so we take a look at egypt so all along this northern section of egypt this is where they get about 25 percent of all of their food this is rich farmland here and what you'll see is is that if we get one and a half meters of sea level rise, which would probably happen after the year 2100, they lose a significant amount of their coastal agriculture, right? And so what do you think is going to happen when a bunch of people in Egypt suddenly don't have food or food prices skyrocket? Of course, you're going to have civil war. They might be upset at the government, overthrow the government. And so this is one of the national security risks because we have a politically unstable region. You don't want, for example, 8 million people basically having to move and being starving. And again, I always say to my classes, I always think of The Walking Dead, right? I think of Mad Max. I even think of the White Walkers in Game of Thrones. Basically, you see relatively good people when they're desperate and they're running out of resources are capable of doing some really bad things for survival. And so I look at The Walking Dead as the zombies is like climate change. Like we're running out of resource because of climate change. Now people are fighting each other for those limited resources. And that's one of the reasons why it's such a national security issue. Okay. So uh, we're going to focus a lot on drought and water because if you think about the most important thing humans need to survive is water. And if we ever saw the, the first Hunger Games movie or read the books, which are very good, by the way, um, when Katniss Everdeen from District 12 goes to the, you know, training, uh, one of the trainers says, you're more likely going to die from lack of water than you are from somebody from District 1 sticking you with a spear, right? So everybody's worried about getting hit with a spear or an axe or an arrow or something. But she said, 
most of you are going to die from lack of water. So one of the first things Katniss Everdeen had to do was to go and find water. And so she ran into the woods and found the water instead of going into the cornucopia and grabbing weapons, right? So the way you think about this is climate change actually increases drought and flood at the same time, but in different regions. So one way we think about this is if you're heating up the Earth's surface, you're definitely going to evaporate more water. So if you think about if we're in a heat wave in you know, Long Island here where I'm speaking from, the grass is going to dry out. So you got to water your plants and your crops, whatever, because that's all evaporating going up into the sky, right? Now, here in the Northeast, we have low pressure systems and fronts that end up causing, it's like a sponge can squeeze that sponge and the water can come back down. But out in the West, the West has always been dry, even before climate change. It's dry because they generally don't have low pressure systems and fronts. They have big high pressure systems and high pressure systems can't turn water vapor into clouds and rain. So it doesn't squeeze the sponge. Well, we know the West is getting really hot. There's been all kinds of heat waves and drought. So what limited water they have is evaporating into the sky. So it's no longer on the ground. And then we have a jet stream, which carries that over to the East Coast, where we have the sponge. We have storms and fronts. That is squeezing it out and causing too much water. So I call it the reverse Robin Hood, because Robin Hood used to take from the rich and give to the poor. But if you think instead of money, you think of water, the reverse Robin Hood, it's taking water from the places that are dry and giving it to the people who already have too much, right? So you're getting much drier conditions in the western half of the country and flooding rains in the eastern half, none of which are good, although drought is worse than flooding rains overall, right? Because you still have to have some water. So here in the northeast, we've been dealing with more flooding rains, whereas out west, they're running out of water. So if you take a look at this map, anywhere where you see sort of orange and yellow areas, those are areas that are probably going to run out of water if we keep warming the planet the way we are. And you'll see that most of the western United States, and we're already seeing that, right, with the heat waves, the droughts, the fires. But look at some of these places, northern Africa, southern Europe, right, India, Saudi Arabia, the Middle East in here, parts of China. These are places that are very politically volatile. We really do not want people there to become even more desperate than they already are. Okay? And we don't want them fighting for this resource called water, which is the most important resource for humanity. We're already actually getting fighting here in the Southwest. It's a bit more in courtrooms, whereas here they're shooting at each other. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Okay, So if you think about where you get your fruits and vegetables from, hopefully you're eating your fruits and vegetables. Uh, about half of them come from California. And it's a multi-billion dollar industry tens of thousands of jobs. And of course, if there's heat wave and drought, you're losing the revenue, you're losing the jobs, you can't have people working if there's nothing growing, right? So this is a really big hit to the economy. Not only do these people not have money to put into the economy, but the rest of us are paying more for our fruits and vegetables, which means we have less money to do other things, okay? We also know that there are lots of places in the world where they rely on melting glaciers to get their fresh water, but they expect that glacier to last a long, long time. And it turns out that there are glaciers around the world that literally are disappearing. In, flat, in fact, Glacier National Park, sometime in the middle of this century, won't have any glaciers anymore. And, how, and then what do you call it, right? Um, so an example would be, for example, La Paz, Bolivia, right? They have a million people in that city. A little over one-fourth of all their water comes from a glacier that will not be there 10 years from now. Imagine one-fourth of all the people on Long Island aren't going to have water from the source that we always get it from in by, you know, 10 years from now. So, of course, you can't let people die of the dehydration, so they're either going to have to bring water in from somewhere else, which will raise the price, or if they don't want the price to go up, they're going to have to subsidize the water. I know they do that in Aruba they, because Aruba doesn't really have much water. Uh, and then other things are going to have to cost a, a lot more because the government's subsidizing it. So if you don't want to raise taxes and you're subsidizing something, it means you have to take that money from another piece of the budget, which is something you might not want to do. Okay. 
So for the first time in 2014, uh, the Pentagon's Quadrennial Defense Review uh, put climate change in the top 10. So the Quadrennial Defense Review basically takes a look at the next dec several decades and says, what are the things that are going to be the highest risk for our national security? And how do we try to avoid them from happening? How do we respond if they do happen? How do we prepare? And climate change was in that list in the top 10 for the first time. And so I bolded this down here. It says the pressures caused by climate change will influence resource competition while placing additional burdens on economies, societies, and governance institutions around the world. Right? That's the whole walking dead thing, right? These effects are threat multipliers that will aggravate stressors abroad, such as poverty, environmental degradation, political instability, and social tensions. Conditions that can enable terrorist activity and other forms of violence. Believe it or not, Al-Qaeda before, now ISIS now, they actually use climate change as propaganda against the Western nations, particularly the United States, saying, look at how you have no water, you're starving, and it's because the United States caused climate change, which caused you to run out of water. So you can see how they could definitely get some angry teenagers to pick up arms and say, we need to you know, hurt the United States. You know, revenge kind of a thing. Um, so you really just don't want people in these politically unstable arenas to become more desperate because they don't have the most important thing they need, that is water. So a great case in point here is Syria. Uh, we all know, hopefully, that Syria was has been in a massive civil war. Uh, what ended up happening was they were already in a bit of a drought, but in the last several decades, climate change exacerbated the drought, made it much worse. And basically, we, we see almost a half a million Syrians um, have been killed, and about a third of the population had to move. And because of that political instability, along with uh, failed policies in Iraq, ISIS, the new al-Qaeda, was born. So here's an example where the QDR report, which we just looked at, said these, this climate change and the limited resources can cause terrorist activity to increase. There it is. So they basically called it. All right. So this picture that you're seeing here, that was actually a farm. Now it's just dirt and rubble. So you're a parent, right? You've got to feed these kids. So you're going to go into the city and look for a job. But they already were struggling in the city. So now you have Syrians in the city who see all of these people coming in from outside threatening their jobs. So basically, civil war broke out, and the Syrian government, instead of helping these people, basically said, We're, you're going to get put in jail. So now we have the conflict that's been going on. Okay? We take a look at Israel. Israel is in the top four countries that is most at risk of losing water. And underneath Israel, Gaza Strip, and the West Bank are aquifers, where they have underground water, where you can pump it out and have your fresh water. Well, it turns out Israel owns all of the sort of knobs that control those aquifers. So when Palestinians, right, militants, fire missiles or do a, blow up a bus or something like that in Israel, one of the things Israel does in response is turns off their water. And like we said, you can't survive without water. So, of course, if you're a... Uh, Palestinian, you don't have water, you're going to fight to get the water. So one of the concerns is that we know Israel's running out of water. So are they going to at some point just say, this is our water, you know, to the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, find your own. Um, so this is a real issue, right? So water is like gold there. So they're kind of hoarding all that resource. We certainly don't want that to continue. And again, the United States is a pretty strong ally of Israel. Uh, you know, are we going to get dragged into something because of the fight over water in the Middle East? Hope not. So then we take a look at Iran. We know Iran has been in the news a lot. Um, Iran has definitely been saber rattling. Uh, they've long wanted a nuclear weapon. Um, and you can see here, this was a major river that is now just dry as a bone. And Iran is the number four country in the world that is going to be most impacted by water scarcity. Part of that is due to climate change. Part of it is due to mismanagement, right? So climate change is like the camel, the straw on the camel's back for a lot of problems that exist around the world. It's the sort of final nail in the coffin. 
So we expect this to happen in climate change, and it definitely has happened. This region, the Mediterranean and Middle East region, we expect to have far less precipitation due to the way weather systems change because of climate change. This has been modeled for decades. They were getting 9% less water in the last 13 years. And to try to water their crops, they're taking 88% of the water basically for agriculture. So it doesn't leave a lot of water left for other needs like drinking water, for example. To make matters worse, Afghanistan also is on the short list of countries that are going to run out of water. I mean, look at this. Look how dry it is. So they have dammed up the Helmand River, which flows into Iran. And the deal was they promised Iran we would still allow you to have water. We wouldn't stop the water flow. Well, guess what? Afghanistan has been stopping the water flow because they're desperate for their own water supplies. And there's already been shooting along this boundary here between the two countries. And most experts say that uh, it won't be very long before southwest Iran has no water at all. That it's basically going to be Afghanistan um, taking that water. All right, well, now we see here's a fisherman in southern Iraq. Right, Iraq, another Obviously, we all know about Iraq, another country in turmoil that ISIS does a lot of work in Iraq. Uh, you get a lot of angry people, a lot of people don't have anything, and these terrorist organizations look very attractive to them. This is where this gentleman used to fish. Now look at it, right? So one of the problems is Turkey, which is a NATO country, has built 19 dams along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, and those rivers drain into Iraq. And so Turkey, because they're hurting for water, has limited the amount of water they let go into their neighboring countries. So in about 10 years or so, one-fifth of the food in southwest Iraq won't be able to be grown because of the water shortage, primarily due to Turkey. Turkey is a NATO country. And you know, if you know anything about NATO, the rule is an attack on one is an attack on all. So if somehow Iraq decides they're going to attack Turkey, they're basically attacking the United States, and it means war. So, you know, you really don't want NATO countries to be fighting over water resources because by NATO law, by the treaty, we have to fight back. The United States, far away. Take a look at Africa. We know Africa's always had issues politically. A very poor country. This red zone right here, this is what we call the Sahel region of Africa. A few million people live there. Right now, they get a little bit of rain in the summer, what's called the African monsoon, and they get nothing in the winter. So this is the Sahara Desert. So in the winter, this red zone is kind of like the Sahara Desert. But in summer, they get just enough water where they can grow crops and then store water and food over the winter. Well, all of our climate models, and we're starting to see this happen, say the Sahara Desert is expanding north and south. That means all of these people who live in this red zone right here are not going to be able to live there in 10 or 15 years. So guess what they're going to do? They're going to go on the move. All of these countries down here are not going to be very happy that people are coming into their country, taking their jobs and resources. And, of course, this whole area is ripe for civil war. Are we going to get involved in that? I don't know, right? But there are a lot of resources in these regions that various countries are going to try to protect. They don't want them at war with each other. So if we take a look at the countries that are sort of on the short list for having serious water issues, Somalia, right, Sudan, Iraq, Pakistan, Egypt, Syria, a lot of these countries are not friends with the United States and sort of the Western ways of life. You really don't want your political enemies to become desperate, right? Especially if they can point the finger at the United States as being the cause of their desperation. Something that for me is the most concerning is we know India has nuclear weapons, right? Pakistan has nuclear weapons. China has nuclear weapons. China, India, and Pakistan share several major rivers. What's going to happen if one of these countries decides to stop the flow of water because their people need it? I think these countries basically would not allow that to happen, that they would threaten war, and then, of course, they have nuclear weapons, 
in order to prevent them from losing their water. You have to have water to survive. So again, you don't want countries like India and Pakistan that have been fighting for a long, long time against each other to basically go to war because of water. But again, it's a possibility, and that's why the Pentagon has it in the Quadrennial Defense Review. All right, coming back closer to home, we know we've seen it, right? The Hoover Dam and Colorado River's getting low. Uh, they're so low, they're actually finding dead bodies and things like that, that somebody, you know, mafia or something dumped over thinking will never be found again. Um, and you can see where the lake levels used to be in this picture, and now they're so much lower. I think that is about 75 feet for scale there. Imagine 75 feet of water gone. I think of a bucket outside maybe, and then 75 feet of water. That's a pretty tall bucket. So the Colorado River is about 1,500 miles long. 40 million people use that river um, for their water, plus parts of Mexico. And like any place that's dry and getting drier, drought has caused a shortage of the water. Uh, people have been using more water than, than, than rain can resupply it. And basically, there are major reservoirs all along this river that are drying up. Some of those reservoirs actually have dams that provide electricity. And so if there's no water flowing, there goes your electricity, too. So Arizona, California, Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, and Wyoming are all fighting over water rights. And the Colorado River Pact, I think it was called, basically uh, the White House gave them two years to redo the plan because the plan was never, ever sustainable. And they didn't consider climate change when they made this plan. And so even though it was unrealistic without climate change, it's impossible, meaning that there was never, ever going to be enough water in the river in the future to give the allotment of water to all the states who wanted it. So because of long-term drought and overuse of water, basically the Colorado River is going to go dry unless they severely limit how much water states can take out. And of course, that water is being used to irrigate crops to sell their food, particularly California, and also for drinking water. So they couldn't come to an agreement. Basically, California was kind of the big kid on the block there, wanted most of the water. Um, so the government basically came up with their own plan. And it means there's going to have to be severe rationing of water in all of these places, which is going to make the price of water go up, and probably it's going to make our food cost a lot more. Now, right now, they're not shooting at each other over this issue. They're in courts, but you can imagine farmers getting desperate at some point if a different state upstate takes your water and you can't provide your business. You, know, you can't grow your food anymore. And then this is kind of an interesting one that a lot of people don't think about. So right now in this region of the Arctic Ocean, there's a bunch of ice, right, in the North Pole. So it's very hard to get through the ice and get anything underneath. But because this ice is rapidly melting away, already quite a few countries are sending teams in there to try to, try to chart the boundaries of their country to claim these resources. In fact, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, the Russians actually sent a submarine with a robotic arm and planted the Soviet hammer and sickle on the bottom, at the top of the North Pole and claimed the North Pole like you might do a flag on Mount Everest. And so this is political. There's a lot of, there's fossil fuels under there. There's heavy metals. There's valuables, you know, valuable metals there. Um, so it turns out the United States Navy believes they're going to have to create an entire new aircraft-based fleet, aircraft carrier-based fleet to patrol this area because it's going to be melted out for several months in the summer every year after 2035, 2040, something like that. Imagine what that's going to cost and how boats traveling around in there, you know, fighting for resources. Again, so this is another area where our national security is going to be threatened because there are resources in these places that countries are desperate to get. So what do we do? We can't, you know, we, you can complain all you want, but you got to figure out how to fix it. So it turns out when you look at a lot of estimates by economists, it turns out that if, if, we start trying to reduce our carbon emissions, it will be a cost, right? Because we're going to have to ramp up, I call it an investment, we're going to have to ramp up other sources to get energy other than coal, oil, and gas. So it looks like we're going to lose a small percentage of our gross domestic product in order to make this investment. 
But if we don't do anything at all, look what happens. We really limit the growth because we're spending so much money on increased price of food and water, uh, wars, right? Fixing everything after droughts, floods, fires. So economically, doing nothing is clearly not a solution. And doing something only has a small cost to it. So it's kind of like taking your preventative mes medicine so you don't get so sick that now you're hospitalized. Okay? Here's an easier way to look at it. And basically what this shows is that at, the sooner we peak at carbon emissions, so you see, let's say 2020 is right here. The sooner we peak, the less steep our slope is for reduction. And what you'll see is back in 2000, when we knew we had a problem, if we had peaked at 30 billion tons of, of carbon, we could have gone on this gentle bunny slope, meaning that we'd, each year we'd have to reduce just a little bit less, right? And we could still be above zero at the end of the century. But now, because we keep kicking the can down the road, we now have to make drastic cuts and we have to basically get to zero carbon by the end of the century. Now think about it, we have 85% of our energy comes from fossil fuels. And what these lines are showing us is that by the end of the century, we can't use them at all, or if we do, we can't let the carbon dioxide get into the atmosphere. So we clearly have to transition away from fossil fuels into things that don't release carbon dioxide. But the longer we take to do that, the harder it's gonna to be to get the results. So one of the solutions is market-based. It was a Republican plan. John McCain, the late John McCain, supported. Mitt Romney was part of it. There was a regional cap-and-trade in the Northeast, and he was governor of Massachusetts. He was all for it. And then, of course, he ran for president in 2012, and he decided that, no, nope, we're not doing this at all. And the idea here is you put a price on a ton of carbon, let's say it's $30, and you say to industries, this is the maximum amount you can put in the atmosphere. Right? If you go over it, you pay a fine. If you go under it, you can sell your allowance to a company that might pollute. And the idea is the fines are much more expensive than buying these allowances or certificates as they're called. So any company that figures out how to keep reducing CO2 now has leftovers that they can sell to a company that's much slower to modernize. So this is a purely market-driven approach, survival of the fittest kind of a thing. And then each year you make this cap, this little circle, a little bit smaller. And so it constantly incentivizes companies to keep reducing their CO2. You could also put a carbon tax. And, you know, most people don't like the T word tax. But basically, people don't want to pay the tax. They'll start doing less, using less carbon. Okay. So one of the things I teach in my, uh, what is currently MET 103 class, and then in the spring it will become MET 201, global climate change is that we know coal plants and natural gas plants emit a tremendous amount of CO2 compared to like a wind turbine or hydropower, right? Now, these are lifetime emissions. So for example, a wind turbine doesn't release any carbon dioxide, but because it has to be manufactured over its life, the manufacturing of that, the blades and the post and everything did release some carbon. Right, so we know we have to get rid of coal and natural gas, right? We can't keep using those. Now, not only are they finite, but they're getting more expensive, and, and of course, it's causing climate change. So I have my class do the math and say, all right, if we remove a coal plant, which produces something called 500 megawatts of energy, how many nuclear power plants, Niagara dams, Shoreham solar farms, or these big, huge wind turbines do we need to build? And what you'll see is, Wow, only a half a nuclear power plant. So basically, if you add one nuclear power plant to the grid, you can shut off two coal plants. And you would have, all of this stuff would just disappear, two times that amount. And a nuclear power plant doesn't emit nearly as much CO2, right? In fact, all of that is pretty much through the cement in order to make it. Once it's up and running, it's zero emissions. The stuff that's coming out of the tower is water vapor, okay? If we could build some more Niagara dams, look at that. One Niagara dam can take five coal plants offline, right? It's one-fifth. We all like to talk about solar and wind, but solar and wind don't produce nearly as much power. So if you're going to take off one coal plant, you need to have 53 Shoreham solar farms. 
So, if, so the problem with solar is, is that it takes up a tremendous amount of real estate. I have solar on my roof. I have 17 panels, and it's a lease, so it didn't cost me anything, and it saves me a little bit of electricity. But you need a lot of solar in order to get rid of one coal plant. Wind turbines, I'm a big fan of wind. 333 of those massive wind turbines to, to just do one coal plant offline. So when you start doing the math, you realize nuclear power, though people are afraid of it politically, right, is, you know, people say I'm never going to vote for that, whatever, but nuclear power is a tremendous amount of energy that doesn't cause climate change. So I do think it's probably something that needs to be in the discussion. If, if we're willing to make massive investment up front, we could power the country with mostly solar and wind, but you still have to have something on the system that can put supply electricity 24 and 7 because solar and wind don't, right? Solar, the, the sun's not always shining, but with a battery backup, you can make sure it's constant. Wind is not always blowing again, but with battery backups, things like that. So what we really have to do now is figure out how do we get these energy sources into the mix so we can get rid of some of these energy sources we know are causing devastating climate change. And that's where your values, your policy, your politics come into play. But again, the solution that is never a solution is doing nothing at all. We have to do something, and it will have to include some of these things. All right, so at this point, I'm hoping you're convinced. But if you're not, let me show you this. Believe it or not, because of heat waves and drought, tomatoes have gotten really, really expensive. That means pasta prices have gone up, and worse, pizza has increased in price because of the price of tomatoes. I know, we got to do something. Pizza and pasta, come on. You're still not convinced? And I think my college students can relate to this. Oh, yes. Cry over that beer because climate change is reducing how many hops we can grow and the quality of those hops. The same thing with malting barley. So basically, we're getting less of these ingredients for beer, and the quality of them is going down. So that means you're going to be paying more for grosser beer, basically. Now I know you're serious about climate change. All right, well, thank you for watching this presentation or attending today. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always email me at mandias at sunnysuffolk.edu, and I'd be happy to talk to you. Thank you.